So Sarah, um, good to see you again. Hello. <laughs> um, as you all probably know, Sarah is involved with uh, the Marie Coven Center for International Reporting at Stony Brook University. And I was hoping, Sarah, maybe if we could talk a little bit about your own personal experiences as a journalist and teaching journalism and, and what you saw in this movie that you felt was important in terms of what it represented to be a war journalist and so forth. Yeah, well first of all I'm really grateful to you for inviting me here and uh, I noticed in the film that those journalists were often comparing the situation to that of Syria and it was um, 12 years ago last month that Marie Colvin, a Long Island girl, was um, killed in Syria uh, in conditions that were every bit as horrific as what we've just seen on the screen. And so uh, I know that uh, had she been alive today, uh, she would have wanted to be in Ukraine. And she would also want to be um, in Gaza, where incidentally they're not allowing foreign journalists in at the moment. So she was a very brave woman. So I'll just say that. What really struck me about that film is that this was the story of an ordinary newsroom this, these these um, folks who are reporting on a war in their own country were just 24 hours earlier uh, reporting the news as you see every night on your own screens. Everything's sort of totally normal. Um, they've got their mixture of sort of human interest stories, politics, maybe even an animal story. Uh, not surprisingly, we almost saw an, we saw an animal story in there. It's sort of all those techniques, except that this was in such horrific conditions. And, and yet I recognize that sort of camaraderie of the newsroom and the way that a team can be called on to do really extraordinary things when put to the test. Um, I brought along a class of my graduate students here tonight and um, they've got that kind of relationship, that camarader camaraderie. Uh, they're good friends, they work together, they support each other. And of course they haven't been tested in anything like the conditions that the Ukrainian journalists are working under. But I recognize that sort of spirit of journalism, that people are brought together by a sense of mission, and uh, they love to work together as a team. And um, you could see with this newsroom that under stress, they became even closer. And everybody had each other's back under a situation that's almost unforeseeable. Um, the nearest thing I've ever been to it, since it's sort of myself in a way, is, or, or I've seen this happen in America, was on the morning of 9-11, where people came in to report the daily news, they had, their, they had their agenda, they had their running list of ordinary stories, and suddenly they had to go and break live to a story which they didn't know really how to report. You know, they, everybody could see outside the window, see the live stream coming in of the Twin Towers, um, you know, with those great gashes in their sides. Um, I was in New York at the time. And I just really admired the news teams and the anchors because there was so little information, they were getting stuff through their ear, they were trying to be reassuring to the public at the same time, they were trying to report live. You know, suddenly, the, you know, you're looking at the Twin Towers, suddenly the Pentagon's under attack. You know, it feels a bit like World War Three. How do you cope with that? Um, you don't know anything about Al-Qaeda. You're hearing rumors that maybe they were involved. You know, you're trying to stand it up, not spread misinformation and panic. That, to me, was some, somewhat reminiscent of um, what the Ukrainian uh, news team was going through on day one. But um, while in the US, you know, we're very grateful that, um, you know, America didn't continue to be under attack. Ukraine is still under attack now and facing as great a, a difficulty as it ever has. So, you know, my thoughts really go out to them. One of the topics introduced in the film, sort of near the end, is the issue of impartiality. <laughs> Um, as journalists, should they be objective or because they have friends and family and they're being so personally affected by the war, is it okay for them to take a side, to cover it in such a way? As someone who teaches journalism, what are your thoughts on this topic? Well, I think it's incumbent on um, outsiders to be impartial. I think it's very difficult 
to demand that journalists be impartial when their own country is under attack. But what, it, what you can be is you can be fair, you can be accurate, and you can not spread disinformation. So I think those are the important things to bear in mind. You're going to tell your country's story. You're going to report on what your president says. You know, obviously, um, they spoke there about the example that um, Vladimir Zelensky um, gave at the time because he didn't flee, so they stayed. And, um, but uh, journalists themselves are very much at risk. If anything, I think the Ukrainian journalists underplayed on day one how much they are at risk. If, if anybody knows anything about invasions and military coups, etc., the first thing that happens is the president's palace is surrounded, the parliament, and also the news stations. Because if you can win that information war, turn the TV cameras off, put on the martial music, and then put up your own programming, you know, with a Soviet spoke, a Russian spokesman, I should say, and some, some, you know. Then you know, you know that's a way of sort of signalling to the uh, uh, public to flee, to panic, and that, that you guys are in town. So I think they were pretty naive, actually, about the fact that they wouldn't come under attack. But that's a reason why news stations do have shelters, even if they didn't know that they were there. Um, but I don't. I think accuracy matters more than impartiality when you and your family are under attack. And there, I think, you cannot be a propagandist for your own side. And that's, that's why I'm putting such emphasis on straight, forward reporting. Nobody expects you to, to start welcoming the invaders or the occupiers or trying to be fair to the Russians. But you're also not being fair to your own side if you don't explain what the Russians are thinking. I mean, there was quite a good bit in that film where they said how Russian propaganda was working in Russia. You know, where they were sort of claiming, you know, they were harking back to the glory days of the Russian Empire or to the perceived um, uh, unity of the Soviet Union when Ukraine had been absorbed into that. So, so there were, you know, you have to explain the reasons for the other side is acting as it does. And again, you explain it accurately. You don't have to be partial to that side. I think there's a romantic notion that a lot of journalists have for some anyhow, of, of going into war and going into danger and covering the story. And you see that a little bit in the film, you kind of referred to it. Is that a normal thing for some journalists to have that calling, to not, not be maybe quite the soldier, but to be that person who will go right into danger to get the story? I think journalists are risk takers. It's in the nature of the profession that um, you want to be where the action is. And we are unusual in that we do tend to uh, run to scenes of um, a crime or disaster or terrorist attack uh, because um, we do feel called on to report on it and to tell the truth. Not everybody, obviously some people are much happier covering celebrity news or, you know, to, to each their own. But there is a sort of, I mean, there is a calling among war reporters. But one of the fascinating things, again, I thought this was a really tremendous film. One of the, the most interesting things about it as well is how people who didn't know they had that calling, who felt they were just, you know, perfectly happy discussing, you know, telling the news about the latest sports teams or whatever else was happening in Kyiv that day, felt called on to report on the war. And I've also heard from so many colleagues who tell me um, that people who were wedding photographers suddenly, you know, strapped on their gear and went to the front lines. People, people who didn't know they had it in themselves found something there. And I'm really sorry, actually, we haven't got here today um, Ira Domlenko, who was a Colvin fellow with us from Ukraine last semester. She was with us until Christmas. And um, she actually came to a previous documentary here about Dan Rather, just out of interest, to see how the American news is reported. But one of the things that Ira told us was that um, we were discussing uh, post-traumatic stress, which a lot of these journalists are definitely experiencing. And she said, yes, PTSD is a real problem. But she said, the Ukrainians have also discovered within themselves um, post-traumatic growth, a resilience that comes from being put under pressure, the like of which they never expected to experience. And I think that's what leads people, ordinary people, to achieve the extraordinary.
You mentioned Gaza. Um, this film is about Ukraine. I, I've been hearing a lot of American journalists uh, saying that it's very difficult to do reporting on these wars. Um, I was wondering if you can speak to like what we saw in the movie versus what we're receiving here on our media. Um, what's the difference between what they're seeing in Ukraine versus what we're seeing on the US media, in your opinion? I think from what we saw in that film, I don't, I, I don't think there's a huge difference between what we were, um, what we were hearing at the time, um, during and in the months that followed the invasion. I mean, what was so shocking for the um, Ukrainian TV station is that an incredible massacre was taking place in effectively a suburb of Kiev, that was Busha. Um, now, the war is um, in further away places, and the number of casualties is just beyond our imagination. It, it is so horrible what's going on. The toll on the um, on Ukrainian soldiers, uh, the Russians are just putting wave and wave of personnel into the war, uh, taking huge casualties, knowing that they have more personnel than Ukraine, and uh, just throw into the fight. And it's very, very difficult now to report from those front lines because they are killing grounds. And um, uh, you heard it said then that you know people shouldn't, you know, that no, it's not worth getting yourself killed to report on the war. People can take huge risks, but you don't want to take insane risks. That said, um, somebody who was injured, a photographer, Paul Conroy, who was injured with Marie Colvin. Um, she, he was at her side when she was killed, and uh, he managed to escape with a very serious wound to his leg. Um, he is currently in a very, very dangerous part of Ukraine on the front lines, trying to say what is happening there. Um, and he has a podcast which you know I can recommend as well. His name is Paul Conroy. So do look that up. I think actually a while back. This particular group screened his documentary under yes. the wire. Yes. So there are in, in, insanely brave people like Paul who are trying to convey the truth. But I don't think the I don't think we're getting the full picture now about the devastation that continues to be wrought on Ukraine. And of course, a lot of the reporters who are in Ukraine have redeployed to the Middle East and uh, are reporting from there, because there are only a limited number of uh, war correspondents at each publication and news media. And very often, what you see on the news is where people decide to put the cameras. I mean, this is, it's, if you've sent a camera crew somewhere, that's where the news is happening. It, but if something else happens that's surprising somewhere else, then maybe you've got to scramble and get over there. But right now, a lot of the attention is going to um, the Israel-Hamas uh, war and uh, a certain amount of um, Ukraine fatigue has set in and a deliberate... Uh, turn against the Ukraine war, which is being um, uh, stoked, I think, by America First policies. Um, so stoked politically, where now if anybody mentions Ukraine, everybody's up, you know, you hear from um, sort of the MAGA crowd, oh yeah, what about the southern border? A kind of classic whataboutism. But what's happening in Ukraine is every bit as brutal, if not worse than what we're seeing right now. There's a talk at the end of the film and I do want to give the audience an opportunity to ask some questions, but um, there's a question as to when reporting on the war, is it important to tell positive stories or is it important to tell the more gruesome details that you were referring to? Like, w w what, in your opinion, is the right balance? Well, first of all, you never really see how gruesome things are. I mean, you saw bodies in that film, but raw footage is never screened on TV. You know, what you're getting in the TV rooms, what the film cameramen are seeing, what the photographers are seeing is far worse than anything that is actually screened on the, on the news or published as a photograph in the, in, in, on, online or in print. Um, so, um, first of all, we are shielded from some of the real atrocities of war. However, 
Um, we're doing a, we're having a really interesting course at the moment for undergraduates helped by a grant from the Solutions Journalism Network, looking at journalists and mental trauma and what you know what they're expect what they go through, whether it could as a war correspondence or you know maybe you, you're covering the culture wars and get a whole ton of social media abuse. You know all sorts of things can be you know really quite upsetting to journalists, and we're trying to give them tools to be resilient to that. And as part of this, we invited um, Christina Lamb, who's a very distinguished um, war correspondent and author, very much the inheritor of Marie Colvin's tradition, who um, works for the Sunday Times, the same paper as Marie. And she addressed our class by Zoom, and she said whenever she goes to a war zone, she always tries to tell an uplifting story. I mean, she will report on the horrors. She's one of the world's experts on, um, she's written a book about rapes and sexual assaults against women in war. She's reported on that in Ukraine. She's reported on the October 7th um, massacre in Israel and the rapes of women there. So she's, uh, she's reported on the fate of the Yazidi girls um, under ISIS who were sold as sex slaves. So she's, she knows all about the horrors of war and she's come under fire herself. But she says, amongst, amongst all that grim reporting, she always looks for somebody who's doing it extraordinary, somebody who can be inspiring and can tell a hopeful story. Um, maybe it's someone who's, you know, I mean, we saw somebody playing guitar, didn't we? And, and they love to hear that person, you know, singing and, and you know, someone who's bringing music to a refugee camp, someone who's doing, who's, um, who's, who's making delicious food that they're handing out or something that, that it's just an inspiring story about how humanity is not lost at war, that actually, no matter how brutal war is, that, um, and how some, no matter how much some people lose their humanity in war, other people do retain theirs and in fact develop strengths they didn't know they had. And I think that's what, she said that's what keeps her sane when she covers all these things, and that's what keeps her faith in humankind. Great. So we're going to open it up now if anyone in the audience has any questions. Uh, my question is when you were mentioning about that before the invasion, uh, that news was kind of normal, the same thing. Uh, and then after the, you know, after 24th of, of February that, you know, obviously it became just breaking news and, you know, very dangerous. But what about all those 10 years, you know, or those eight years before that in the Donbass region with the constant shelling and of, of, of Russia and the, you know, and, the occup and the occupied territories that, have, you know, that have been occupied for, for um, eight years? What, what about the, um, you know, the, uh, Type of, of journalism that was being done at that point, you know, was was it was that normal or was that uh, uh, breaking news? And you know, because you had that, that that war going on, you know, after the Heavenly Hundred, when when um, uh, he was that um, when Yanukovych was deposed. So, can you explain that to me? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you make a really good point about the war, the Russian invasion in that sense, effectively having started in 2014. I certainly remember the time when Yankovic was deposed and the incredible scenes from the Maidan um, when there was a, a sort of color revolution in Ukraine and it was um, you know, extraordinary images coming out of there. Then the war in the Donbass started, it wasn't, um, so it was always sort of fought as a kind of proxy war by the Russians, they always pretended it wasn't quite a war, that it was a sort of, you know, even now actually they, don't, they pretend that the, Russia, that the invasion of Ukraine is somehow just a sort of special operations, but the, um, uh, because uh, the, the Donbass region had a majority sort of uh, Russian-speaking population, they really tried to sort of carve it out as they've done in other areas. You know, Moldova has a Russian enclave called Transnistria, you know. And, and although I, don't, I certainly don't want to downplay the tragedies there, I mean, at the time, 2014 to about 2017, I was editor of the Sunday Times magazine. We run, ran a lot of spreads on what was happening there and investigations, and so did our foreign news reporters. Uh, so it's not that people were ignorant of what was happening there, but it was somehow um, not considered a fully-fledged invasion of the whole country. Now, what happened um, two years ago was that suddenly uh, they moved from uh, 
what was sort of a, a, um, a uh, majority Russian enclave into a fully fledged assault on the entire um, Ukraine and an attempt to decapitate the regime, to um, arrest uh, President Zelensky and to um, install a new puppet regime in Kyiv. So um, I think that's when the war um, went to a whole new level and the rest of the world suddenly woke up. There are an awful, I mean, this is going to sound cynical, and I really don't mean it, because I do care about wars wherever they occur, but there are a lot of conflicts going on that are somewhat frozen conflicts in the world, or even that hot up in areas where there aren't enough resources, aren't enough TV cameras, where people don't care as much as perhaps they should. And that's what was happening with what appeared to be a sort of, a bit of a sort of stalemate situation where in, in, in the um, Donbass area. And where, and, but once the whole, um, the capital was coming under fire, you saw scenes of um, the airport, the Russians tried to storm the airport at Kyiv. If that had succeeded, it might have been a whole different story, but they were held back there. And that made a huge difference. And the fact that um, the entire country was invaded did mark a sort of difference where the rest of the world suddenly thought, oh, we've got to pay attention. It isn't just another of these frozen, forgotten wars that happen all over the world. I'll come down with uh, the mic. Yeah, I think I can oh, show. Do you think the press should, the Western press, should have suppressed the information about the damage which gave the Russians' feedback of effectiveness. Uh, so, which information do you mean? Apparently, they said that they really did not want to give feedback to the Russians about the effectiveness of their missiles, but they criticized the Western press for giving immediate feedback. Oh, uh, yes, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think the Western press should be free to report on what's really happening. And I think, um, to be honest, I think that uh, so should um, the Ukrainian TV stations, um, that, that they can report setbacks. As long, you know, that it's not like they, they should just be saying everything's rosy, because otherwise they would lose all trust and credibility. It's very important for news organizations to have credibility with their audience, or people will stop listening. But that's why I've made such emphasis on accuracy and, and um, honest reporting in that sense. So I think, I think, where, think where there are setbacks, they should admit them. Um, but you know, if some things are, if they want to, <laughs> what we might say, accentuate the positive, I'm not going to criticize them for that, as long as they do fairly report on what's happening. But there are things in wartime that they're not allowed to report on. I mean, President Zelensky recently gave casualty figures of 31,000 um, Ukrainian dead. Most people think the numbers are far higher, and it's actually the first time he's released those casualty figures. And um, there are considerations that I'm loath to really wade into about um, trying to keep up morale on the home front. But people know from their you know, the sons, the husbands, the, the friends they have who are dying from the graveyards that are filling up, just what a toll this war is happening. And if you're, is having. And if you're not honest about it, um, then people start to um, uh, lose faith in you and doubt your credibility. And that, that is every bit as morale sapping, in fact, far more so than not telling the truth. A uh, question on process. Does a media company, like the one we saw in the documentary, the, the day that the attack started, did they start telling stories on video about themselves? Or, you know, how, does, how do the pieces fit together to create this masterpiece of a documentary? Well, that's a wonderful question and one that I've actually been asking myself because I haven't actually spoken to the documentary makers, I don't know. But they obviously decided early on that um, telling their own story would be of interest, would be of historical interest. They're journalists, they've got the equipment and um, 
we heard from one of them who volunteered to serve, uh, you know, with his rifle, that he was keeping a journal, that he was taking photos, that he was shooting video. One day, who knows, maybe he's going to write a masterly book about it or, you know, release incredible film and we'll be here talking about his documentary in the future. So I think there's a huge, I can imagine, um, I don't believe the director of that film was from that newsroom, but I believe a policy decision would have been taken early on to say, why don't we record our own experience? Because this in itself is a story. And um, a very compelling one, I think, you'll all agree. And Sarah, Sarah, uh, since I actually had programmed this film in September um, and interviewed the director, I can tell you that um, uh, Laurent Jaoui, his wife, is one of those journalists. Oh, well, so there she, you go. she splits her time between Paris and Kiev, and she was actually in Paris in February 24th, 2022, and um, he made it his mission working with her and her relationship with the, that news team to bring that information out and to organize it. And, uh, and if you belong to our, our mailing list, we sent everyone out um, uh, a YouTube video, which you can look up, uh, of an interview with uh, Laurent Jaoui. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, I'm actually really grateful for that information. And there you have your answer. But um, they, they, so somebody very shrewd, um, i.e. the director, uh, recognized straight from the off that this was going to be a very compelling human drama in itself because, um, you know, when it comes to geopolitics, that matters, but what really makes people pay attention are the people stories, the human drama um, behind the big world events, and I think that this film conveyed that really well. Come in with the microphone for your question, right behind you. You say that you try to teach your students truth uh, to be the cornerstone of their reporting. And as you know, this is the United States of America today, where 30% or so of our people have a different truth than I would guess yours is. And some of those may even be students in your class, because we do see that on college campuses. How do you teach that, uh, to, to bridge those two or separate those two? Uh, you just ignore the 30%, the it's a small percent to ignore, a large, large percent to ignore, rather. Uh, it, it's, it's one of the questions of the day, I think, for this country. Yeah, it's one of the enormous questions of our age. You'll notice, for example, that um, in that film, there was a very effective scene, I've already alluded to it once, but how, um, how Russian propaganda has got very sophisticated. It isn't um, the old uh, clunking uh, Soviet propaganda where you know they just disappear somebody from a photograph if it was inconvenient and just lie through their teeth. They've managed to sort of construct a sort of shiny narrative themselves. And so one of the things that I think is going on in America as well are fake narratives about what's really happening, but all dressed up in very kind of entertaining and plausible guises. And, um, but I think, you know, you just have to stick to objective truths. I mean, there are certain things where you can say, well, one person's truth isn't exactly another person's truth. Um, the Queen famously said about her um, wayward grandson and wife, Harry and um, um, Meghan Markle, who apparently said, recollections may vary. There's a certain amount of sort of, you know, where some people think they're telling the truth and others insist, no, no, that's not what happened, this is their truth. That's, that, that's within a sort of spectrum. But where people are just flatly claiming things that are false, we just have to patiently keep explaining. Well, this is what we know. What you know, if somebody says the election has been um, stolen, you say, well, you know, let's look at uh, let's look at the evidence. Let's look at where this has been proven or disproved. Let's look at what the courts have to say about it and what the verdicts were of the courts. Let's look at all these other avenues. Mm -hmm. And and after that, people choose to believe absolute nonsense. I'm afraid. 
uh, you know, that's very, very hard to resist. But undoubtedly, we live in an age of disinformation that is, is um, that the um, TV stations like the one you saw in Ukraine and our own uh, terrestrial and cable TV show are no longer the gatekeepers of the news. There are all kinds of platforms now where people can spout absolute nonsense and um, get away with it. There are troll factories that come out of Russia that were definitely at work um, in the 2016 election and are taking off again. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that people just are for Russian propaganda or didn't have their own reasons for voting in the way they did. But we just have to be vigilant all the time about sources of disinformation. And for every one that you expose, a new one steps forward. And um, you know, we're soon going to enter the age of AI big time as well. And we've yet to see its full um, destructive potential. I'm sure there are good ways to be able to harness it so we don't have to do the more boring side of journalism. You know, we can use technology for our benefit, but I'm sure it will also have unforeseen consequences. And we just have to keep trying to stay one step ahead of the game and call it out where we see it. It's difficult, though. Can, can I ask your opinion? Uh, right when the war started, in America, they, they took down the RT channel. Yeah, you know RT? Yeah, Russian and, and Today, I mean, Russia today it stands for. Yeah. yeah. And I, I know that, you know, we're talking about Russian propaganda, but, but it was a place where Noam Chomsky was on there all the time, Chris Hedges. There were, there were a lot of people on the left. Oliver Stone was on there all the time. It was a lot of left voices. And they were people that were consistently critical of war. I'm not saying they were right, but are we better off losing that? Because they're not allowed on mainstream media, these people. They have their own channels for peddling their own views. Of yeah. that are pretty, in my view, I mean, now you're asking me to give my opinion on these people, but I think that they're- Not these people, but are we better off shutting that down completely? Um, I, um, I'm not really in favor of shutting down channels, um, but it has happened in Ukraine, it happened in Moldova. You know, in Ukraine there would be um, pro, uh, more pro-Russian channels, and there would be, um, and also in Moldova and stuff. So, the government took, took them down on the grounds that they were spreading disinformation. And I think, it, you know, when you're threatened with invasion and war, then I think that that is, um, you know, why give a whole platform to your invaders to sow uh, disinformation? Not everyone would agree with me. I happen to think that Russia today was basically an operation arm of, um, of the Russian intelligence service. And um, so I'm not, I'm not particularly sympathetic to it. But I understand what you're talking about when you say left-wing voices. A lot of people think that Noam Chomsky has a lot to offer. Um, and, you know, but Noam Chomsky still has a voice. He still has platforms. Oliver Stone still has platforms. I don't think we have to give the Kremlin a platform just because they give, the Kremlin gives a platform to people who are um, much more sympathetic to a Russia point of view on, you know, the war, etc. But you can still you can still find plenty of sources of information if you want to hear those voices, if you want to hear voices for peace. I, I personally, I don't feel like a, a, a channel that's paid for by um, um, Vladimir Putin's regime particularly has a worthwhile place in America, but it's an interesting debate. Any last questions for me? I noticed that the journalists were speaking both Ukrainian and Russian, and they seem to be getting along just fine. So I think that gives the lie to the Russian position that Russian-speaking people in Ukraine are being uh, marginalized or discriminated against. Yeah, well, if, you, if, if Ira was here, our, our Colvin Center fellow last semester, she would tell you that she was um, Russian-speaking 
that she grew up as a Russia, Russian speaker. Um, but she actually took a political position, not everybody does this, but she took a political decision not to speak Russian. And she only speaks Ukrainian now. Um, because she doesn't want to speak the language of the invaders. Um, a Colgan fellow that we had from Moldova last year, Ekaterina Mishishina, she was also a Russian speaker. And that was her first language. And um, she actually, unlike Ira, she actually really enjoyed speaking um, Russian with a, Russian pro with a professor who'd um, been a Moscow correspondent. And they, they got on like a house on fire because they chat together in Russian. But as, as like Ira, um, she was speaking more and more um, Romanian, which is the other language of Moldova. But of course, a lot of people, you know, these, these countries used to be part of the Soviet Union, so a lot of people are both uh, can either speak Russian or grew up in Russian-speaking households from the off. And, um, and they'd much rather now be speaking another language in their day-to-day -day life. And if the audience found this movie informative, I'd like to recommend 20 Days in Mariupol, which is in a similar vein, but even more raw. Yes, I, I'd like to second that. I think that's an amazing film. And um, this one I found particularly fascinating because it's about a newsroom coping with reporting on itself. And I, I should add, um, just to add another dimension of what's going on in the world, is that um, because um, foreign reporters are not allowed into Gaza, and there are petitions from major news organizations like CNN and others to be allowed in to report, everything that you are seeing on the ground in, uh, that comes out of Gaza and is coming from Palestinian journalists working in horrendous conditions while they and their families are under fire. And I think it's really important to let international journalists into Gaza to report on what's happening there. And uh, that it's, it's too much to ask for um, Palestinian journalists to be reporting at huge risk to themselves and to have to report for the Western media to standards that we would expect as well about what's going on there. You know, and when their own families are under bombardment. So then all those questions of how impartial you can be it is partly thrown up by that. But um, I, my heart really goes out to them. And there have been over 80, maybe over 90 by now, um, journalists and media workers killed in Gaza. That's, um, this is more media workers killed than um, in one small place than usually happens over a long period of time. So it's absolutely devastating, that conflict, to journalists on the ground. And uh, so as we end tonight, um, we had had a slide earlier uh, about Razum for um, it, uh, Together for Ukraine. So if you are moved by anything that you had seen and you want to do something to help, uh, please consider going to, Ra it's R-A-Z-O-M, for Ukraine, and uh, it's a very reputable charity uh, that is really helping uh, the Ukraine people. Uh, so if you feel so moved, please uh, seek them out. And uh, I want to thank you all for being out tonight and hope to see you at the next screening. Uh, let's have a round of applause for you.